Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome to a very seedy episode of That Time on Murder, She Wrote. Yeah! Basket? What a cutie! That's right, we get Jessica Fletcher, the floozy. So I hear you're the man that I should talk to. Orgy. And as a funny aside, you can Google Jessica Fletcher floozy and get these images and the name of the episode is from. Perfect. We're going to go back into the wild world of season 5 of Murder, She Wrote. I always find myself going back to these episodes because they are some of the most bonkers, and it's of course where you can find the one that inspired this entire series, Something Borrowed, Someone Blue. It's a little surprising I haven't covered this one yet because it features Jessica Fletcher in pure barfly mode, hair gelled for the gods, smoking a cigarette, and talking in a strange high-pitched cockney accent that does not exist in nature. I've personally seen this episode a few times, it just seems to come up a lot for some reason and it's requested for me to talk about on this channel a lot. So let's get into this hot mess titled Weave a Tangled Web featuring Celery, necklace on necklace action, bartenders dressed as valets, and our favorite deputy, Floyd. Sheriff! We begin our story in Cabot Cove, Maine, where a family is doing some baking. Dad is being very dad-like. I almost dropped it! <laughs> Mom comes home and greets the sugary sweet children after being away on a business trip. They ask if she brought them anything. Oh, I left some packages in the car. This is Victoria and Ralph Proctor. Happily married, though Victoria has a demanding job that takes her away three to four days a week. It does pay well, so she's able to fully support her husband and his children. She asks Ralph if that hurts his ego. Oh, my male ego's fine, believe me. Yeah, it's the best ego out there. My ego's great. I'm sorry, I just need to point this out. What is this double necklace action? It's a pearl necklace over a diamond necklace. Pick one or the other. This is just silly. Victoria gets a call from a man named Eric Bowman who has, quote, business. His hair frightens me. He makes some vague threats and tells her to meet him at the bar at the Starlight Motel. Eric, I can't handle this. You've got to change that hair. Business in the front, party in the back. Which is it? Enter Jessica, who is of course friends with Vivian and Ralph, as she is a friend and mentor to everyone ever in the entire world. While they are on their way home from shopping, Vivian asks Ralph to take the packages home while she runs some errands, dropping her keys in the process. Look at that teeny tiny license plate. What kind of vehicle is that for? A car for ants? Cut to Eric, who is rifling through a desk. What in the hell are you doing here? Wow, that escalated quickly. Actually, it didn't even do that, did it? It's just already at 100. What's the word for when you skip the escalation phase? This is Eric's wife. They're separated, which is why she wants to know why he's in the house. The truth is I'm trying to find my squash racket. In this desk. Let's see you in court, darling. Should have never gotten the same haircut as him. Back at the Proctor house, we learn that Vivian cannot make the kids baseball game because she agreed to meet up with Eric. What's the matter? I gotta go bang a dude. Wait a minute. Weren't these cars parked completely different two seconds ago? Look here. Here's the station wagon, positioned right in front of the garage, with the Ford Pro positioned right in front of it, nowhere near the garage entrance. So as you can see, this car would need to be moved to this position to get this car into the garage, where we can plainly see is behind the station wagon, but there was no driving involved in between these shots, so I call this one a continuity error. It's CD bar time. Is it just me or is this trucker guy severely out of place? Like, did you miss the diner down the road or something? Reluctantly, Vivian meets up with Eric. So... This guy is dead. Already? Yep, it's Eric. And what's this? Vivian's keys are right next to the body? How intriguing. Don't worry, Dr. Seth Hazlitt and Sheriff Metzger are on the case, and I like to call this segment, Two Old White Men Talking. They smugly talk about their findings, trying to outwit one another, and argue about who is the better detective, as they often do. At one point, they even name drop Sheriff Tupper. Now, old Amos always kept his ear to the ground and his nose to the wind. Aw, Tupper. I miss him and his insatiable desire for pie. A note on very pretty stationery is found by the body. The killer has great taste in paper. Sure enough. Floyd! Thank God, we need some golden retriever energy in this sea of cocky chihuahuas. He confirms that the keys don't match any of the cars in the hotel's parking lot. Good job. Meanwhile, Vivian is called back out of town. Is everything okay? I gotta go bang a dude. I understand. Oh, thank God, Jessica is back. She rushes into the station to find Seth, reminding him that he needs to drive her to the airport for a children's benefit, and I need to point this out. 
there is always a benefit. Jessica Fletcher is always going to them, and it seems to be because it's a good way for Jess to run into a suspect or a character in a situation she otherwise wouldn't. It's also to demonstrate how generous the character is to some degree, but when you watch so many of these episodes back to back, you notice the formula. Seth says that it just nearly slipped his mind, what with the Eric Bowman murder, which Jess had heard about from Metzger's wife. Before Jessica leaves, Floyd comes in and states that the keys found next to the body belong to her friend Vivian Proctor. She decides to stay a little longer so she can assess the details. Metzger questions Ralph first, saying that he found their keys at the murder site. Ralph explains that he dropped them somewhere at the ball game, and Jess says that anybody could have picked them up, which is fair. Oh, nice ducks painting. Metzger's smugness gets bumped up another notch as he finds the stationery used to write that note found at the crime scene. And that note's probably got her prints all over it. Jess is deflated, but has to catch the last flight out to New York for that benefit, but she'll be back the next day. While on the road, Seth starts an excruciatingly annoying conversation about how odd Vivian and Ralph's relationship is, that it's unnatural for the woman to be the financial supporter and for the man to be the caretaker for the kids. Man, staying home, cooking, cleaning. Jessica looks like she's about to fire lasers out of her eyes. Why shouldn't a woman be the breadwinner? We stand an ally. Seth is often portrayed as a diet sexist, set in his traditions type of man, and I know it's played up and exaggerated for humor, but sometimes I find the whole sexism for comedy thing very tiring. And I love this show, but... Come on. At least Jess is always there to knock some sense back into him. He tries to convince Jess that Vivian was cheating on Ralph with Eric and that's why she must have killed him. Jess is not hiding her frustration. At the Children's Fund benefit, Jessica talks to the man who arranged it, a wealthy person named Miles. You know what they say, Jessica? Women should be the breadwinners. Miles is thrilled that Jessica attended and supported the benefit. Anyway, you're my big surprise. Oh? For my wife. Kinky. Take a guess at who the wife is. Just go ahead. Guess. Pause the video, write it in the comments, lock in your answers. Okay, ready? J.B. Fletcher, my wife, Vivian. No, it's okay. See, she's different, because her bangs are brushed back now. Jessica meets up with Vivian in another room. Vivian asks her to be gentle in her judgment. I'm too confused to be judgmental. Me too. What is up with this necklace? It's worse than the double necklace. Vivian explains that she had been married to Miles for 15 years, but the spark has long since faded, and she felt that she had been living in his shadow. After she found a job and success for herself, she longed for a different, more independent life. She fell in love with Ralph three years ago and also married him. What? How in the world did they keep this a secret? She really did have to leave to bang a dude. Jessica stays the night so she can talk to Vivian in more detail the next morning. Thank you for being so understanding. Also, do you think this table is long enough? Jess agrees to keep Vivian's secret for now, but insists that she'll need to come clean at some point due to these new circumstances of Eric's death. Vivian had no idea what was going on, so Jess fills her in on the murder, her keys being found, everything. She claims that she only met him once on a plane. He had made advances on her and she denied him. When they get back to Cabot Cove, Metzger interrogates her and asks her if she was having an affair with Bowman. Ralph resents the remark. I know my wife, and I trust her completely. <laughs> Vivian admits defeat when Metzger informs her that the bartender placed her in the Starlight Motel bar the night of Eric's murder. She says, yes, she did meet up with him, but only to beg him to leave her alone. Jess steps in and tells Metzger that something is still missing, primarily the murder weapon. She also mentions that he didn't even question Eric's wife, who he was going through a bitter divorce with. Super sloppy police work, as usual. I just wouldn't want you to be embarrassed by acting too quickly. Jessica spitting fire. Later that day, Seth pays her a visit and notices she seems to be itching to get something off her chest. She eventually tells Seth about Vivian's double life. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is the worst spit take I've ever seen. Absolutely amazing. Can we get an instant replay? Jess pays a visit to Eric's ex-wife, who tells her that Eric had a severe gambling addiction, which is why she filed for divorce. She explains that the Starlight Motel is a gambling den run by somebody named Augie. Jess also learns that she has a solid alibi and is likely not the killer. Okay, let's jump to what we've been waiting for. That's right, it's time for gaudy J.B. Fletcher, who is jamming out to some sick beats. She looks like she should be at every casino in Vegas. So I hear you're the man that I should talk to. 
Oh, good lord. She tries to talk to him by feigning interest in horse racing, but he isn't impressed and the sting is a bust. Meanwhile, Sheriff Metzger receives an anonymous tip about the murder. It leads him to Ralph. They catch him on his way out. Metzger quickly reaches into the car without even searching around and just pulls out a bloody knife. And I have questions. First of all, what the fuck kind of knife is this? Second of all, where did he pull this thing from? How did he know it was right where he found it? And how did Ralph not notice it? This just screams planted. Vivian finally tells Jess the truth about Eric. He had followed her to New York, saw her with Miles, and decided to blackmail her for $50,000 to pay off his gambling debts. She went to the motel that night to hand it to him in cash. Their convo is interrupted by a call from Seth, who informs Jess that Ralph has been arrested. Jess is not happy about this, of course, and goes to defend him once again. No, so far, every Everything you've said is extremely stupid. Why were there no fingerprints on the weapon? If it were Ralph, why would he hide it in his own car? For days. Who was this supposed concerned citizen who called in the tip? Metzger isn't moved and has Floyd lock him up. Well, that makes Vivian's decision on who to stay with a lot easier. Jessica desperately tries to figure out how Vivian's keys got to the murder scene, and finally we get this key piece of evidence. She says she accidentally left them at the bar and had to use a spare set, and I'm like going feral at this revelation. You didn't think that was a very important clue? You left your keys at the bar? Where Augie and Eric commonly hang out? Why didn't you tell anyone this? Aw oh, yeah, gambling Jess is back. She asks Frank, the bartender, if Augie is coming in. Augie. Oh, come on, Frankie, I'm cool. Angela Lansbury, everyone. She is fucking amazing. She manages to get Augie's number and also leaves Vivian's keys at the bar for the bartender to find. She calls Augie and says she has information about Eric. He shows up at her house and she brings up his gambling debts, but Augie just denies everything and any involvement in his murder and leaves. So who actually did it? Who's left? Augie never actually received any money, it actually went missing, so he figures out that Frankie, the bartender, must have taken it as he overhears everything that goes on in the bar. He finds the money just as the police arrive to arrest Frankie. Nice leopard print. Vivian comes clean to Miles, decides to also be honest with Ralph, and starts living her denim outfit dreams. Okay, final thoughts. I love this episode. It's a classic murder mystery setup with blackmail, affairs, gambling, going undercover, red herrings. It's a really fun story with some delightful acting from Angela Lansbury. Actually, everyone's acting was really great. Sheriff Metzger is extra cocky, Seth is extra salty, and Jess is extra sexy. Oh, there are a few plot holes and inconsistencies in this story that I want to bring up. Most importantly, that the knife is never mentioned again, even though there's a shot that sets up how Frankie got it. It's a small knife he uses for cutting up limes, lemons, all of those bar components. The episode never addresses it after it's found in the car. We can assume Frankie put it there, but it's not explicitly said in the conclusion, which is a pretty big oversight. The episode did conclude abruptly, so maybe the creators didn't have time to go over those details. There's also a few mistakes with the cars and the car keys. Earlier on, Ralph says he loses his keys at his kid's ball game and had to use the spares and the station wagon. These keys are for the station wagon. The episode confirms it and points it out several times. Vivian does not drive the wagon, she drives the Ford Probe. So why are the keys found at the crime scene the ones for the station wagon? She left her keys at the bar, which presumably would be a different set since they are able to drive their cars at the same time. Just a small error I noticed as I was writing the script, but other than those things, I thought the story was good and interesting, and I absolutely recommend it. If you have an episode of Murder, She Wrote, you are dying to see me cover, please leave your suggestions in the comments. Almost all of the episodes I discuss here are viewer recommendations. And until next time, happy sleuthing. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching my video on Murder, She Wrote, Weave a Tangled Web. I hope you had fun listening to all those twists and turns. If you want to see more breakdowns by me, I have so many. But first, I want to thank my patrons, for without them, I would not be able to keep drinking coffee. If you want to donate to my caffeine fund so I can stay awake while editing these videos, please consider joining my campaign, which is linked in the description. If not, I really appreciate comments and likes because they drive engagement and views. If you want to see more from me, I have a few suggestions. On the right, I have a breakdown of two science fiction episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents that were written by Ray Bradbury. Super bonkers stuff. On the left, I have the previous episode of that time on Murder, She Wrote, which features Chicago accents and exotic locales. Thanks again, and as always, I will see you in the next one.